All right, hey everybody, uh, good evening. Welcome back to the Contrarians. We're here with a really cool uh, panel discussion on an interesting topic that we got our Patreon folks to um, vote on. So the one that won out is called Odd One Out. And I'm actually going to throw it over to Brett to explain the topic tonight. If you wanna join our Patreon topic discussions, you can join us over at Patreon at any tier. And uh, we try to have these as regularly as we can. And we have an amazing knowledgeable group of patrons. Um, and we'd love to see some new faces and we always enjoy love seeing the old faces too, right? Well, I don't want to say old faces, but familiar faces. So I'm going to throw it over to Brett because Brett came up with this topic and this topic won, I think almost by like a landslide. This one got, I think the most votes out of anything that we did. So I'm going to throw it over to Brett and you explain the topic tonight and I'll even let you go first. So take it away, okay, Brett. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for those that had voted for this. I felt it would be an interesting topic. We get a chance to talk about maybe bands that you won't really hear about that much in our conversations. But the topic that I had chose was um, Odd One Out. Everybody has that one band that they listen to that maybe when they tell people they listen to it, they're like, wow, really? Like you listen to that band. I would have never have guessed that in a million years. Um, and you know, some people can consider it a guilty pleasure, but I wouldn't really, I don't, I don't know. I just don't, I, don't, I just don't like that term. So yeah, I figured it would be a really cool idea to talk about this. And since uh, Marco's let me go first, uh, when it comes to hard rock and heavy metal, you know, all these different genres and all the encompassing subgenres, it doesn't really shock people that know me that I love hardcore music, but then I also really love like a band like the Eagles. Um, but one group, that always garners a reaction of surprise when I tell people that I listen to them is uh, this band right here, Duran Duran. Cool. Um, I have a fondness for 80s new wave, 80s pop. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> were, were, were they your was were they were they your choice as well? Yep, that I'll oh, keep wow. going. That's all right. <laughs> never, and I didn't. I, I never. I was like, nobody else is going to choose this. Um, but yeah, I, I really, I really, I have a fondness for um, '80s new wave, '80s pop, and they were out of all the acts and artists that came out of that time, they were one that uh, had always stood out to me. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fairly young. I wasn't. You know, I was born in 88. So by that time, they were kind of off their their peak compared to like their, you know, in the early 80s. And I had gotten to them. Wild Boys era. Huh? That's Wild Boys era. 88. Yeah, yeah. Notorious Wild Boys 88. Um, I would found out about them actually through a video game. I can't remember what video game for the life of me, but they had a one. Uh, the Reflex was a song uh, on some some video game soundtrack. And I listened to it. And I was like, wow, this song's really good. And it turns out my mom had had like a best of CD and I listened to it and I immediately became a fan. And from there, you know, I just did what I could to make my way through their discography. Uh, and even up until now, you know, they're, they're very much a band that has obviously done their best to change with the times in terms of what their music sounds like compared to what other contemporary pop acts are putting out and for the most part I've enjoyed it uh, they just put an album out uh, maybe a couple months ago uh, it's it's interesting they're definitely incorporating a lot more um, electronic aspects in their music but I feel like at, at its core it's still you know they it's still kind of um, has that Duran Duran sound they're one band I wish I could see live um, every time they've come around in the past few years, unfortunately, it's, you know, either I couldn't go see them or something else has been going on. So I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, with everything that's going on with, you know, this ongoing pandemic that eventually, hopefully they'll be able to, um, make their way into the States. And just one last thing, I, I feel like they're a band that doesn't really get enough credit. Um, I would definitely consider them underappreciated. Um, unfortunately, in that time, whether it was new wave music or even like a genre like hair metal, you had all these bands that sounded the same, but there was always like maybe one or two bands that did it the best compared to everybody else. But because they had that association, they kind of just got shuffled away to the side. You know, they were great music, they were great songwriters. Uh, the music was catchy as hell. Um, and even the, uh, the first album, 
it was very post it was like that new wave post punk and i feel like they did it better than a lot of other bands that were coming out at the same time but yeah there's uh that's my choice uh, i don't know if you want to hear what peter has to say since we had the same one i'm sorry i like i said i didn't think anybody was gonna pick this one that's uh that happens yeah peter it? go for it all right well great minds think alike um Duran Duran that's my pick um I think the thing that got me into Duran Duran is I always even though they're a pop band I always thought there was a bit of edge and a bit of muscle so you had um as a pop band um you had John John Taylor and Roger Taylor I think they had some of the the tightest uh, rhythm bottom end in any pop band now you listen to Planet Earth and I was just listening to the debut last night and all you hear is that bubbling bass line. It's just all the way through. Um, John Taylor, um, you know, great bass player. Um, Andy Taylor as a guitarist, he always had that metal edge. Um, and there's a big um, interview him on YouTube and he said that, look, my I, all of these uh, guys lived in, they came from Birmingham, 1978. And um, basically, Andy Taylor was saying that um, he was reciting that I saw Black Sabbath at Birmingham, supported by Van Halen. And when I saw Eddie Van Halen play, that's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to become a guitarist. But you had this melting pot of all these different personalities. You had Simon Le Bon, who's channeling Brian Ferry, Roxy Music and Bowie. You had Nick Rhodes. Um, channeling um, a band called Japan. Now, if you think that um, Duran Duran were original, get uh, Japan and their first couple of albums and you go, oh, now I see where they copied that sound. And then you had um, the rhythm section of John Taylor that were into that chic, um, that really, you know, and then you had a bit of the Sex Pistols and that new wave sort of influence. But if you really want to get into Duran Duran, I think the first four albums, that's a killer. Yeah. Um, Rio is a is a classic that's got all you know Rio um, hungry like a wolf um, seven and the ragged tiger um, and this one too also, this is a good another good live album yeah. arena yeah. <laughs> even notorious which you know I thought oh it's a little bit slick I played that last night it still holds up it's more of the chic going less of the synth pop into more of the chic type um, Prince type of music um but yeah they went through a period that they put a lot of albums out that weren't so good um they uh, had a bit of a comeback with the self-titled Duran Duran album with um Ordinary World which was a bit of a comeback come undone then they made a very forgettable uh covers album called Thank You um and I don't think a lot of the punters thanked them because they were doing songs like 911 is a joke um and um, white lines which was instantly forgettable um a lot of the band broke away then they had a comeback with the fabulous five and um they're making albums to this to uh to this day brett i, I still think they're, they're actually appreciated because they're still a draw card you will never see them on those 80s shows you know where they have um those 80s sort of sound wave shows where you have Wang Chung does two songs and then you bring yeah. on um, Scritti Politi or whatnot and they just do a couple of numbers. They will never do that. They headline and they did the um, the City Limits Festival in Austin and they pulled in a, a crowd. And if you look at who has been influenced them, uh, by them, The Killer's first album, Hot Fuss. Don't tell me that doesn't have an ear on the Duran Duran's first couple of albums um you've got very much uh, the modern day smashing pumpkins uh courtney love all of those artists have always said gee in the day i like duran duran and, and they were really the bomb and you know and you can see in the later albums they get people like timberland justin timberlake um janelle monet um you've got all these really sort of high power people that are wanting to produce and contribute to their albums so you know, it's it's their influence on pop culture just goes beyond. One thing I have to say is the thing that draws probably you and me, Brett, was the visuals, not them, but girls on film. <sighs> Need I say no more? 
the yep. MTV. They conquered MTV because a lot of those video clips in the um, before those Duran Duran were just sort of done on videotape. They look cheap. They got the director. They got Russell Mulcahy. They did these little mini sort of Indiana Jones movies, like Hungry Like a Wolf. It's like a little Indiana Jones movie with beautiful women on yachts. It's just, it's playing the adventure. And that's why they just conquered the world. But for me, I always thought that they had a bit of a metal edge. And it's, it's sort of, um, you know, with Andy Taylor, he went into Power Station. And I don't know if you guys have ever listened to that album. I did when it came out. Yeah. Um, it's noodling. It's all Eddie Van Halen um, finger tapping. And you could see, you know, that band was always on the fringe of not just being a pop band and the image, but also had a little bit of a metallic uh, rock sort of leaning. And that's the thing that hooked me in. But those first couple of albums are killer. I always go back to it. Highly influential. And they still tour today. I've seen them a couple of times. They still hold up really well live and um, they're going to do a tour next year um, supporting Future Past, their new album. And um, I recommend see it. So there you go. It might be another side project called Arcadia. Not so yeah. good. Not so good. I've got that as well. But um, yeah, I played that the other day. That doesn't hold up, but Power Station holds up. Yeah. I, I remember Election Day being a great song, though. Yeah, just I played it the other day. Didn't really. Might give it another I, list. I remember the end of the uh, video. It's a view, view to a kill. Bond. Yeah. Simon Le Bon. He's like, Bond. Simon Le Bon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were huge. I mean, you, you, they had great hits. I, in my opinion, Hungry Like a Wolf is one of the best 80 songs ever written. It's from Rio. It's one yeah. of the best songs. It's, it's it. got a great riff. It's Absolutely. got a, you know, it's, it's, it's pop. It's great pop. And as he said, this is very interesting because you, because you compare them with Rock's music and Brian Ferry. And I think that that really, really is great comparison because, you know, that was, that was the, that was the sheen they had, you know, you, you, they were very glamour. Yeah. And, um, I'll put a question out to everyone. Great. I'll just put a quick question out. Yeah. I was thinking about, do, do you think that they, their image and that new romantic influenced hair metal and a lot of the imagery, don't tell me that Rat and early Motley Crue in that glam period did not look at Duran Duran and some of those clips and just take it and put it through their filter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially when they saw how it, how it made, like, you know, women react. I'm sure that definitely played into it. Yeah, and vice versa as well, and yeah. vice versa. I guess I guess some of the um, from the glam glam hard rock thing went back into the pop thing as well. You know, because those videos were shown at the same time. Yeah, so people looked at it, and people worked with the same people. You know, people worked with Godling Cream, um, which I think made. Uh, girls on film, um, hmm. the guys from 10CC. And I think they've worked with uh, hard rock acts as well. You know, the, the, you know, the, the exchange of things and the inspiration of things. So I think, absolutely, I agree with you. I agree with you. A lot of uh, metal bands saw these, you know. You know, my, uh, my introduction to Duran Duran was uh, when I was in high school in 1981. I had a, we had a friend who was an exchange student from the UK and uh, he didn't know anybody. And he was in, you know, Atlanta, the Southern United States. And we invited him to a party and he brought a record. And it was that, it was that first Duran Duran album when nobody had heard it. And uh, it was the one with the red letters with planet earth first, like God intended, like you guys showed. And uh <laughs> We heard it and we were, we hadn't heard Japan yet. So we were like, what is this? And uh, it was cool for that to, for us to like it. And then for it to get like super popular, it was like, oh yeah, we're really smart. <laughs> we heard it first. <laughs> and there's a rated R version of the girls on film video too. 
Yes, there Jamie, is. Jamie, that gets played all the time in Australia, I tell you, on those <laughs> late uptight. night uh, video shows. They love it. We're uptight over here. We see boobs on TV, we melt. Cool. Well, I guess, I don't know, unless anybody else picked Duran Duran, I guess, Peter, you can pick who goes next. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll leave that to you guys. I'll... <laughs> My pick is Duran Duran adjacent. <laughs> okay, you go next time. Yeah, yeah okay. sorry. A nice shirt, by the way. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, so my pick is another band that came out right around the same time. And it's these guys right here, Spanda Ballet. Uh, Gary Kemp, Martin Kemp, uh, Steve Norman, John Keeble, and Tony Hadley, the vocalist. Um, they started out as a the house band for for this uh, this uh, club in, in London called the Blitz. And uh, there were these kids called the Blitz Kids and they were, are credited for creating the whole new romantic fashion thing. And uh, I mean, they're, they're nobody. They were just kids that went to a club, but uh, <laughs> these kids really liked this band. And so uh, they uh, made a couple of singles that got some, uh, some attention and they made their first album, Journeys to Glory all dressed up in their puppy shirts and uh, pretty good album, keyboardy, uh, new wave kind of music, um, reinvented themselves on this album, Diamond, the second one, 1982. They uh, had some funky horn arrangements and side two of this album is almost ambient. So it, it's very much like side two of, uh, of uh, David, David Bowie's Heroes, which makes me wonder if maybe they were copying that. Um, reinvented themselves yet again as a uh, kind of slick adult contemporary pop guys and uh, did that very well. Apparently it was always something they always liked, uh, Frank Sinatra and Tony Bennett. And so when they did this album, it wasn't really, they kind of had it in their mind all along that they were gonna do something like that. A um, Little bit harder edge on this album right here, Parade 1984 and uh, after that, things start going downhill in the United States, um, but they're still popular in Europe. Um, they put up this album here, 1986, uh, Through the Barricades. This album was uh, not released in the United States because they lost their deal in the States. And so it was released on Epic later, like almost a year after it came out in uh, Europe. And uh, produced by Gary Langan, who is one of the... Uh, one of the guys that works with uh, Trevor Horn a lot. And so it's like, I've heard this album called their uh, arena rock album. Um, it's heavy -er. it's not really heavy, but uh, <laughs> but it's a pretty good album. It was insanely popular in, uh, in parts of Europe, like in, in Italy, apparently there was a riot at one of their shows because not everybody could, it was an outdoor show and there were hundreds of thousands of people there and not everybody could get in. So, uh, <laughs> They, uh, the album after that was called uh, Heart Like a Sky. It came out in 1989, um, came out not at all in the United States. Um, they're not getting along real well. You can almost sort of look at the picture and look, sell that they're kind of sick of the whole thing. And uh, <laughs> while, they were, while they were split up, they, uh, there was a lawsuit. Uh, the, three, uh, the three guys uh, that aren't named Kemp sued uh, Gary Kemp for, because they weren't, didn't get enough, they didn't get as, as big a share of the royalties, but Gary Kemp wrote every single song. So they lost that, uh, that lawsuit spectacularly. And uh, they, um, they later revealed that, you know, their, their, uh, their attorneys pushed them into trying to do that. They never really wanted to do it. Um, in uh, 2009, they got back together and they did some shows and they made this album once more, which is basically something that a lot of older bands do. It's, it's mostly acoustic arrangements of songs that already exist with a couple of new songs on it. Um, they had a couple of songs in 2014 on this compilation called The Story. And uh, there was a, a documentary made about them called Soul Boys of the Western World. It talks about their start and everything that happened to them. That came out in 2014. And there was a rumor that they, they, they had started recording an album with Trevor Horn and uh, nothing ever came of that. And eventually Tony Hadley, the singer leaves and uh, they try to replace him and it just kind of falls apart. Um, one of the things that happened was that fun facts about Spandau Ballet, 
Uh, Gary Kemp is the lead singer in uh, Nick Mason's band Saucer Full of Secrets, mm. and uh, which is really cool. And he's like the the kind of the he does the singing, and uh, it's really funny because I've heard people say, "Wow, I didn't see that coming." One of the guys from Spandau Ballet is basically in Pink Floyd now, and it's like I'm not surprised, but <laughs> a lot of people are surprised. Um, uh, when uh when when they were first uh, uh getting started and starting to get really popular they were friends with uh duran duran and uh spana and duran duran had kind of a gentleman's agreement that uh that uh duran duran would conquer the united states and spana ballet would conquer europe and that's kind of what happened um i don't think that they had some kind of master plan or anything i think it just kind of worked out that way but uh but uh, so I always thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and uh, what a lot of people don't know about Spana Ballet is they're actually, they started out just, you know, bar barely being able to, not really being able to play that well. Basically, you play this and I'll play this. And uh, some of them turned out to be really good uh, instrumentalists. Uh, Gary, Gary Kemp is a great guitarist. Um, Martin Kemp is a fantastic bass player. He's probably not as good as... Uh, as John Taylor is, but he's kind of in that kind of area, uh, similar kind of bass player. And um, the one guy, uh, Steve Norman, the guy that plays the saxophone, he started out as a rhythm guitarist. And he wasn't a very good rhythm guitarist. And so they put him on percussion. And then they finally, at some point before they made True, they said, yeah, you know, it'd be great if we had a saxophone. And so he learned how to play the saxophone and uh, started out as not a very good saxophone player. If you listen to those, uh, if you listen to True, the first album where he played, I'm a, a, a not very good saxophone player. So when I heard him play, I was like, oh, yeah, he makes a lot of the same mistakes that I do. But it turned out to be pretty good uh, over the years. So um, so that's my band, Spanda Ballet. I almost picked a different band or bail out of this because I thought to myself, you know, people who really know me know how much I like Duran Duran and the other new romantic bands. So this band is really not that far out. You know, somebody that likes prog rock could like Duran. Somebody that likes Duran could like Spana Ballet. But Spana Ballet gets kicked around a lot. And they're, they're not very well respected in the United States. So that's my band, Spana Ballet. I used to get them confused with OMD and ABC. <laughs> For most of my life, OMD was my favorite band. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. Um, all three great bands, it would be easy to confuse them. Um, you know, it's funny because uh, I, I always think of uh, some of the front men of those kinds of bands. Like I always think of, uh, of uh, uh, Martin Fry from ABC as kind of like the fake uh, Brian Ferry. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's kind of what the guy from Spanda Ballet is too. And Richard Butler from The Furs is the fake David Bowie. <laughs> so, so yeah, they all had kind of a tall guy in a coat you know at, at the front that had a lot of charisma so i could see how that could happen so it could have been the duran duran show yeah. <laughs> it could uh why don't you pick who goes next todd um let's uh see what uh jamie has for us all right well to be honest it's kind of hard for me to surprise people because I have quite a bit of variety in my collection. Um, I have a jazz collection that's growing every day. I got about 80 reggae albums. I was just listening to Funeral Doom before we started this. I got death metal to, I got everything. That's why I hate when people tell me, like younger people, I said, what do you listen to? Oh, I listen to everything. Oh, it's a pet peeve. Because to ev everything to them means I listen to country, I listen to modern pop rock like Imagine Dragons, and I, and I listen to hip hop. In their world, that's everything. And that's not even close to everything. Mm. So, but I, did, but I did raise some eyebrows this summer when I made a certain purchase. So let's take steps though to there. <laughs> let's take many steps. Okay. Because I do have albums, I have pop albums. I have the Debbie Gibson album. I got the Taylor Dane album. And you might be thinking, well, you know, Laszlo, it's, it, it, he, he just likes the nostalgia of it. You know, he was a teenager in the, in the uh, 80s. 
which is true. It's not like I sit there and I listen to the Taylor Dane all the way through or anything. We just play the hits when we're hanging out. So you're thinking at least you don't have 90s pop. Well, I do have TLC. And I mm -hmm. do have some Britney Spears. Nice. And you're thinking, oh, I just found those for, for a buck somewhere. And they just play them every once in a while. Yes, that's true. And you're like, well, at least he doesn't have modern day pop because modern day pop is the worst right well this summer i bought the new latest miley cyrus album and i gotta tell you man i love this album i love it i spent 10 bucks on it i because i saw her on saturday night live do the uh, title track i'm like that's cool i'll pick it up for 10 bucks on amazon and you're thinking well he picked it up for 10 bucks that's not bad a couple months later, I went out and bought it on vinyl for 30 bucks <laughs> because when it's over, it's like 43 minutes long. And I swear to God, when it's over, I'm sad. This album makes me that happy. I would say it's, I'm going to go overboard now. It's my favorite album in the last five years and one of my favorite albums of the last 20. Her and, albums um, are surprisingly good. Th this is, it, it's fantastic. It's pop rock. It's power pop. It's, it, there's, uh, she channels Tammy Wynette at times in a couple songs. Every song, she does a song with Billy Idol, a song with um, Joan Jett, but she's always performing with like legend legendary people. She, she on the new Elton John and on the new uh, reissue of the Black Album, Metallica Black Album, she does mm -hmm. Nothing Else Matters with Elton John and Yo-Yo Ma. One of the best covers I've heard in the last decade, if not the best cover of the last decade. It is amazing. You got the bass player from Metallica on it. Uh, and you got Chad Smith from the Chili Peppers playing on that one song. And it's great. Yo-Yo Ma and, and Elton John are going back and forth at the end. And her voice is really smoky these days. But then you're probably thinking, well, at least you don't have any other uh, of her albums. Well, I do have the one that came before. <laughs> and it's not bad. Uh, Luckily, I do not have any Hannah Montana albums. I swear to God, <laughs> I'm not jamming a Hannah Montana in my Jeep. Gotta break but the then ice. you might be saying, well, Laszlo, don't go walking around with like her T-shirt or something, you know, on your chest. Well, guys, <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> too late. <laughs> Here we go. I wear oh, it proudly, man. too. And I will tell you this. I went to... Uh, Vegas for Psycho Vegas, which is a three day metal um, festival where it's like 80% death metal. I came out of the Mastodon show with this t shirt on, and a dude walked by, this big metal dude. He goes, That album's a 10 out of 10. I know, right? <laughs> so I'm not going to convince you guys to listen to it. But if you do, if you listen to Plastic Hearts, and you can see she's a Plasmatics fan, too, by the way it's written. This chick knows her music, man. All right. She could sit in, in, uh, with us and probably out-talk us about music. And she, she's the covers queen. Go on YouTube and put in Miley Cyrus covers, and you'll get 100 results. And she doesn't just do covers. Like, she went on uh, the Tonight Show, and she did a Bob Dylan song. Did she do Blown in the Wind or, uh, you know, Mr. Tambourine Man? No, she did some song that is only available on a box set from 1962 that nobody knows unless you have that certain box set. And she did it on TV with millions of people watching. She does a Pearl Jam cover. Does she do a live? No. She does Just Breathe off a 2009 album that nobody knows. So she digs deep, man, and she knows her shit. So, yeah, I developed a crush on Miley Cyrus over the last eight months, and I'm not afraid to admit it. <laughs> She's good. Her covers are amazing. Yeah. Her Zeppelin stuff is nuts. Yeah, yeah she uh, sang with uh, members of uh, Temple of the Dog for a Chris Cornell uh, tribute and, you know, banged it out of the park. All her covers are great. I mean, she does one with Billy Joel, uh, New York State of Mind. She does Tiny Dancer with Elton John. There's a reason why she's with these big names. Yeah. 
there's a cover she does on YouTube, which is probably the one, the best I've ever seen her do. And she, I don't know if it's a mashup, but it's, she does it with Stevie Nicks, Edge of yeah, 17. It's, it's absolutely sensational. The originals on this and the vinyl mm. has the mashup with Stevie Nicks, which means it's, it's okay. It. it gives you shivers up your spine. It's that good. Yeah. The original um, is good too, without Stevie Nicks. Yeah. There's no Edge of 17 in the original yeah. at all. And she does she, cranberries on this cover and Blondie. I I think she could front a metal band. It, yeah. I would like to see her, you know, you know, like in a, to, you know just yeah. Lady Gaga. I got well, her latest yeah. one too. That, I mean, she, she's a metalhead, Lady Gaga. Oh, yeah. I know Lady this might Gaga. be another subject, but you know, the, the Gaga and uh, Miley, they could just front metal bands because they've got the voice, they've got the projection, they've got the look. They could easily front a hard rock band, and I'd love to see it. Well, look at uh, YouTube and put in Miley Cyrus, Nothing Else Matters. Uh, you watch the video from the mm. studio version, or she went on Howard Stern with Metallica as her backing band and performed it. Badass. Mm. So, and her new album is going to focus around, I have a feeling every album is going to be kind of a little different and she might lose me along the way, you know, and I don't have any of her more hip hop albums, her yeah. early ones. These two I like. The next one's going to focus on like disco era, like Studio 54 type music. I'm, I'm not mad. Is is she huge in the States, like Beyonce huge, or she's no, not quite at that no, level? Nobody's Beyonce huge. God, that woman. She's definitely yeah, big, but I mean, her. from a from a commercial point of view, does she, like her albums, go to number one? Has she got that you know sort what? Of... That one went to like number three, debuted at three, and she's not having right. big number one hits. You know why? Because she's too good. She doesn't suck yeah. enough for this it's, American. It's, so crowd. it's because the rock thing is yeah. she's not in the R and B going in that direction. She's going right, and rock she and, busts into comfortably numb in the middle of the concert, and all those kids don't know what it is. Yeah, so, but she's being her. She doesn't give a shit about that, which is really cool. Jamie, mm. so. can you do me a favor? Who me? Yeah, Jamie. What? Can you go like this? And recite the alphabet backwards? No, but I can do it <laughs> and uh, tell you the lyrics to Plastic Arts. <laughs> you want to pick Dude, who goes next? This was my summertime album. I listened to it nonstop in the pool. You want to pick who goes next? Oh, uh, Ryan can go. All right. Um, this was really, really hard for me to decide because kind of like Jamie, I have like a really wide variety of music tastes and a lot of people who know me know that, you know, I like jazz, I like soul, I like funk, I like punk, I like new wave, post-punk, uh, metal, hard rock, classic rock, a little bit of hip hop, not really a whole lot though, um, but so I kind of have like a criteria with this for myself. Um, had to be a band that I'm actually like a really big fan of currently. It couldn't be, cause I've had like phases where I get really into a musician and then they kind of fall away from me. Some of them have been, have been pretty weird choices. Um, wanted it to be somebody I have in my collection just cause that's kind of like a statement to how big of a fan I am of them. Um, and also just like, a band that when I tell people that I like them, even if there is a lot of people who like them, I've kind of consistently seen that it also makes a lot of people like, what the hell? Or even, you know, people get like kind of nasty about liking them. Um, and so that made me narrow it down to like three people. A couple of them, though, I decided not to do because people get mad at the bands for political reasons. Um which is Bruce Springsteen and Ted Nugent. I just like both of them. They're great musicians, you know, and I don't mm -hmm. think a lot of people dislike them because of the music, it's more politically, which, so I didn't want to add that into this list as my choice just because of that. Um, so the other band that came to mind for me actually happens to be my favorite band at the moment. And they've been my favorite band for a little while. Um, I guess you could call it a little bit of an obsession and it's Steely Dan. Um, you know, they're just so, so, so good. Um, 
I listen to them more than any band in my collection. I listen to them in the car all the time. And I have more records by them than any other band, including multiple copies of certain albums. Um, so I'm just going to run through that real quick as I talk about them. You know, I've got weird stuff like a soundtrack that Donald Weck, uh, Donald Fagan, Walter Becker, and Denny Diaz did before they were even Steely Dan. Got the early years of Donald Fagan, Walter Becker. Um, you know, debut Steely Dan album, Can't Buy a Thrill. Countdown to Ecstasy. Pretzel Logic. One copy of Katie Lied. Two copy of Katie Lied. Three copy of Katie Lied, including a MoFi copy. Um, first copy of the Royal Scam. Second copy of the Royal Scam. Uh, first copy of Asia. Second copy of Asia. Um, oh, a MoFi copy of Asia. Um, their greatest hits, Gaucho, and Donald Fagan's first solo album. And I'd like to get their two albums from the 2000s also because they're great albums. Um, why do I like Steely Dan? I mean, they're just truly a brilliant band. I mean, on top of fantastic lyrics that really just make you think so many different interpretations that what they say in just one line or two lines. And on top of the lyrics, also how they use the music to convey those lyrics. Um, it's just brilliant. It's really thought provoking. Um, just some of the best I've ever heard. You know, I always hear people talk about Bob Dylan's lyrics, but musically for me, he never really captivated me as much as his lyrics did even though I do like Bob Dylan I think Steely Dan's kind of like that perfect package of both brilliant lyrics and brilliant music and on top of just great songwriting in general they have some of the best musicians ever on their albums you know especially as you get into like Katie Lyde and Asia and Gaucho you know it's just really just albums of session musicians coming together you know if one band didn't work out for a certain track they got a whole other band to do that track and they did it track um take after take after take until they found the right version and it might be like kind of ocd but it's also just amazing because it produced some of the most wonderfully sounding music of all time and the production too is just brilliant. Like sonically, I just go crazy over those albums. The drum sound is so good. The bass is so good, especially on albums like Asia. Um, yeah, I think my two favorite albums by them are uh, Katie Lied and Asia. And then number three would probably be The Royal Scam. And the interesting thing about it is, you know, I did a video on my channel I say a couple months ago about Steely Dan. Um, and at that time, Asia was one of the, or not Asia, Katie Lied was one of the lower ranked albums on my list. And that's just a testament to how great of a band they are that I could listen to their albums over and over and over again, all of them. And then my opinion of them could change so differently. Like I always liked Katie Lied, but I thought that there was better albums. Now it's possibly my favorite album by them other than Asia, or maybe even better than Asia. Um, yeah, I just think that they're a very consistent catalog. Um, I like all their albums. Like I said, even those two from the 2000s, I think they're brilliant albums. The one won a Grammy, or a couple of Grammys actually, and I think it deserved it. It was long overdue for them to get one. Um, but I guess the reason why I put them on this list is because even though they are well respected in some circles, I know I'm in a lot of music groups on Facebook. And when I talk about loving Steely Dan, I get a lot of nasty comments about how they like suck or how they're just elevator music and stuff like that. And I'm just like, you just don't understand it. Like, that's fine. There we go. Good stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. But you know, they're way more than elevator music. And um, also being younger, a lot of people are thrown off 
that I'm not like 55 loving Steely Dan, um, but 24 and loving them just because it's, you know, kind of a band that isn't really known for that. Although I have been starting to meet a lot of people my age who are really getting into Steely Dan, which is weird like really, really into Steely Dan, like also one of their favorite bands. So that's kind of a cool thing I'm seeing. Um, but yeah, I just think that when it comes to a catalog of albums, they are one of the best I've ever heard. And they're my favorite band personally. Um, I think that I never really heard a song by them that I think is a bad song on any of their albums. Um, which is really impressive. I mean, there's certain bands where I could kind of say that also. Like, I think that even though I don't like every Led Zeppelin song, I think that they never really wrote a bad song, at least on their main albums. Um, you know, bands like that. But Steely Dan, I actually like all of their songs where I don't with any other band that I can think of. Um, and that's why they're my favorite, but I guess they are still kind of a controversial choice. And it was kind of hard to put them as my choice today because they are my favorite band, but I just couldn't really think of anything that was like a fair offering. You know, there's a lot of weird stuff like the Bee Gees or like certain like hip hop groups that I do, I guess, like, but I like like one or two songs. I don't count that as being a fan of a band. I think that's just like, you know, they have a few cool songs. Um, so yeah, that's why Steely Dan's my pick for today. Yeah, the 90s albums were released on vinyl not too long ago for record store days. Yeah, I'm it's looking at out it. pretty fast. Definitely. I heard they sound amazing too. They're good Steely Dan songs, but without a hook. You know, none of them really have much of a hook. So, That's true. Yeah, but they're good. When you yeah. were saying young people are getting into it, it's a bit like Toto, uh, I think, um, you know, appealing to that younger audience because one of my favorite bands and is Toto and they get trashed a lot. And um, I know Tim did a recent episode on, on through this, these guys. And um, yeah, I think similar sort of, you know, they've got a bit of an appeal to um, a younger audience. Definitely. Yeah, I know. I think that um, they kind of overlapped a little bit. Jeff Porcaro played on some Steely Dan songs, I think in like the Katie, Katie Lyde era. Mm. So that's pretty cool. I don't own one Steely Dan album and I've gone to heaps of record fairs and I've looked through the bins and I've Steely Dan and go, oh, put it down. I might, might try. I might get Aja and give it a bull. <laughs> I'd recommend it. It's probably yeah. the best sounding album I've ever heard. It's mm. like the production on that one gives me chills, especially if you get an original ABC pressing. It will say like AB1006, I think, on the spine. Yeah, AB1006. Yeah. It sounds so good. So if I like Toto, I'd like Steely Dan, would I? I think so. They're yep. kind of like a more analog version of Toto, in my opinion. Jazzier version. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, All right. I resisted listening to Steely Dan uh, or being a fan of theirs for a long time. And I didn't, I didn't even start listening to them until like I was in my late 40s. And when I was younger, I always respected them. But I would always think, I don't understand these lyrics. These songs are just dumb. They're about nothing. They're about these people that we don't know anything about. What are they talking about? And then... I, I heard an interview with them and they were saying that the, I think it was Donald Fagan was saying that the, the lyrics are supposed to be like you picked up a novel and you opened it to a random page and you just started reading. And then I was like, wow, that, that's what it's like. And then after I heard that, I was like, okay, I think I understand what they're trying to do now. And then I listened to everything again and I could appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, He's apparently a very interesting character, that Donald Fagan. I've read a lot of articles about him. Very secluded, introverted. Um, yeah, a bit of a mysterious, you know, rock yeah, star sort of character. Watch their classic albums documentary about Asia. You can find it on YouTube. 
just seeing their thought process as they went through the production and stuff is so interesting and like their how neurotic they were about it too it's like it's kind of humorous to watch and like just because of how serious they took things but when you hear the actual final product it's like it paid off in the end we'll watch that after to you me, watch Miley Cyrus. Yeah. To, to me uh, to me this is summer music this is very much summer music i was given a compilation of theirs uh, in the late 90s I've heard a few tracks before that, but I played it constantly, that collection, because it's so good pop. It's mm-hmm. great pop. It's, it's, it, it's very intelligent. It's very sort of uh, worked through, um, very constructed, very good. I mean, I love the early albums. Like the first time I heard Reading in the Years, I thought it was a uh, Crosby, Steel, Nash and Young outtake. It sounds very, you know, you have the, you have all the uh, harmonies and stuff. And I really love that. I think yeah. they are just you fantastic, those early albums. I, I agree. You don't get any music sounding like that in contemporary music at this point in time, do you? Really? Yeah. That's why it's so refreshing. And that's why a lot of young people are getting into this sort of music. And I hate to say the term, but the yacht rock, that mm. sort of genre, there's nothing there's no bands that you can hear and correct me if I'm wrong that have that sort of sound. And that's why they go. A lot of people are tapping into that music of the seventies, the late seventies mm-hmm. and early that California, that West coast sound um, corporate, you know, you don't get, mm-hmm. you don't hear that anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Same with Christopher cross, like that first oh, album. Yeah. So brilliant. <laughs> Christopher Cross is sitting there in his house right now. When's it my turn to be big again? <laughs> yeah. If you asked the 13-year-old me, Christopher Cross, I would have said, what? <laughs> the 54-year-old? Yeah, it's it's great. Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, that's, uh, why don't we throw it over to Pontus? Why don't you let us know what your uh, album yeah. is? Um, I thought, yeah, I had two ideas when I, I sat down. One was to pick up records that you know you stumble over or some old uh, lady friend leaves in the house you know but I, I I decided to stay with an old love and this man has hanged with me since I was free can you see it the king Marco's yeah. a big fan yeah There's no shame in that no absolutely this is, uh, I'm a huge Elvis fan. I'm a huge Elvis fan. I've been there since I was three years old. Um, I was introduced, I was very contrarian when I came to be introduced to him because my mom had a collection of film songs. So I, I, was, uh, I was robbed the wrong way. I was introduced the wrong way, of course, to, uh, you know, Bossa Nova Baby and all that stuff, Fun and Acapulco. Sharrow and all that. And I I just loved his voice from the beginning. And the more I look at it, this is uh, Elvis is back from 1960. Um, this is his comeback album from After the Army. He's on fire. He's, um, this album is very eclectic. Um, it has blues on it. It has uh, nice ballads. It has... Uh, um, pop and he's on fire and he's really going for it and um, he has Reconsider Baby which is one of his best blues um, blues recordings ever but once you, you get deeper into this catalogue you find you find gold where you're not supposed to find gold this is a CD of his last oops, here it is uh, of his last um, soundtracks. Uh, it is um, Change of Habit, it's Trouble the Girls, and it's um, Live a Little, Love a Little. I think they put Shoro in here as well. Uh, the song Change of Habit has the same rhythm section as Hot Rat Sessions by, by Frank Zappa. It has uh, Max Bennett and it has uh, Oh, what's his name? I mean, I, I think Jim Gordon is on here. Um, 
or well, yeah, John Gurin was his name. This is a great soundtrack for what it's, you know, even some psychedelia in here. You know, he, he really tried, you know, if you dig deep, you can find very good stuff. And, and of course you have, um, what I'm showing now is actually the Follow That Dream uh, reissues that was uh, reissued by the estate and had all these um, outtakes on them. Actually, the, these are presented in um, seven inch sleeves. So they are like mini albums. That was the first one. And um, here's an old favorite. Here's an old favorite. It's in person from uh, 1969. Uh, it's a live album that was released in, in November uh, 1969. It, it, it recorded in his first Las Vegas um, show. And um, you can tell he's very nervous, but he's still on fire. He wants to go live. He has a good, had a good run at the with the comeback in 1968, and he had um, a good album with from Elvis in Memphis. So that album is a very good introduction and uh, one of his best live albums, if you can get it, it's uh, the record, That's the Way It Is. And if you get the um, remasters, you get extra concerts. And the concerts were recorded in 1970 in August. There's different box sets of that. And that, that's his, you know, that's the holy grail of Presley live. Because he's on fire there and James Burton is with him. Ronnie Tutt, who sadly passed away um, on drums. Jerry Sheff, who later worked with uh, The Doors. Um, I think he even got Whitney Houston's mother in there somewhere. <laughs> so, it's, 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 yeah, it's great stuff. But it, it's like you said, Ryan, um, this is also music that got ridiculed through the years, but it has been uh, reassessed now. People are, you know, looking at uh, the recordings at Stax in 1973 and going, oh, this is really good. Mm -hmm. um, by albums that was um, looked upon as, you know, not very good. And what the estate did and what um, in the in the late 90s was putting out these um, albums. They compile albums that was not meant to be, really. But in the 60s, he made so many films that they had to pad out the soundtrack album. So they, what they did, they made bonus songs on the albums. So they never made a real album from 1962 to 1966. They just recorded tracks that we put on the albums. That's, as to as a filler, but people now have assembled those sessions and made great albums out of it. So um, it's a great, you know, it's a great love for me, and I I I'd never get tired of it. So um, and uh, as you can see, I'm a prog fan. I have a T-shirt here saying uh, from. <laughs> uh, prog magazine going drink drink tea and uh listen to prog i'm a huge prog fan but elvis is always in my heart in a sense it was the beginning awesome so that's my pick oh yeah i'm a huge elvis fan too um i wouldn't i wasn't gonna pick him for my odd one out but i mean like he's just what an incredible voice what an incredible performer. Like he's got so much charisma, even like he's fun to watch. And what I like about Elvis too, is he looks like he's having fun. He's always joking around, even on that, that album that you showed the in-person one, the, the Las Vegas report. I had that yeah. in my stereo in my car for like months, just playing like over yeah. and over and over again. And like the stories that he tells, he has fun with the musicians on stage. He has fun with the yeah. audience. Like he, he just looks like he's having a blast. And he's one of those artists where like, you can go to a used record shop and just see it. There's always a huge Elvis section and you could look through it and see all these albums and you don't even know if they're albums or compilations and they've got songs you've never heard of before. Yet, yeah. if you pick up that, um, there was the two, the number ones and the number twos albums that came out where it was yeah. all the number one hits and then all the other 
B-sides and number two hits and whatever. It's like, you know, every single song on those compilations. Yeah, you can go and pick out albums where you've never heard a single song or you just, you know, like, and usually if you go to a UCD shop and look at the Elvis section, they're usually pretty affordable. They're like $3, $6. Like, you know, I think I bought that in-person one. Um, I have all his record, like um, video recorded stuff. Like that's the way it is, the DVD. Yeah, um, yeah. that's just fantastic. Oh, what, even uh, vinyl? You have, yeah, you have, you have albums like Elvis Country. That is, I have that, yeah. I think I bought the amazing like albums, you know, gospel yeah. records, all kinds of stuff. He did all kinds yeah, of yeah, stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Love Elvis. Here's, here's a, you know, on, on those soundtracks, on those later soundtracks, there's a beautiful song called Clean Up Your Own Backyard, which yeah. is just uh, um, country rock, Ella 1968. Just fantastic. It's a reality, sort of, sort of dreamy psychedelia in it. So yeah. you have to dig deep in, in this catalog. You know, if, you, if you go past those collections, you will find, if you go, uh, you will find gold. Yeah, well, I wash my hands in muddy waters and oh, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Like that's just an Elvis song I've never even heard of. And then I bought that CD and it was on there. I was like, this is amazing. And like um, yeah. the one he, he does on Hawaii, Elvis. the gospel, this time he, Lord, you gave me a mountain. Like listen to his vocal performance on that. Just incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, just an incredible performer. I love Elvis. Elvis I like is Kentucky Rain, the song Kentucky Rain. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's Written beautiful. by Eddie Rabbit, I think. Yeah. I, I yeah, think Elvis. so. Elvis is so. It's a, there's, a, there's a song on, on, on the um, Stranger in My Own Hometown, which I think is a Percy Sledge, Percy Sledge song, could it be? Uh, which is a bluesy, you know, a blues song for, you know, five minutes. And it's, it just, just blows, man. You know, it's just fantastic. But as I said, you know, a lot of people look down their noses on, on Elvis, like, especially, the, uh, especially the 70s and the late 60s, like, you know. But, um, you know, you, you find something that is just extremely good a, a lot of music he influenced a lot of musicians but a lot of musicians also kind of started turning their nose up at him a little bit when he started wearing the jumpsuits and he went off and joined the army like even the beatles like you can find paul mccartney talking about how the early early elvis was stuff that influenced him but then once he shaved his head and he started saluting and even later when he started wearing the jumpsuits, guys like Paul McCartney, the guys he influenced were kind of like, what are you, you know, like, what are you doing kind of thing, right? Like, they, they kind of, he kind of became out of favor for even the musicians that he influenced, but he influenced everybody. He's the first person to have that level of fame in the world, you know, and TVs just came out. Yeah, I mean, Ian, Ian Gillen from Deep Purple, Elvis is his favorite singer. That's, mm. uh, he said he's based his vocal performance on Elvis. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the cool thing about Elvis, too, is, I mean, I think he only co-wrote two songs in his entire mm. career. He's an interpreter. But mm. you would never know that listening to his songs, you know, like that he performed, he put so much emotion into them. It really felt like he was telling a story in his vocals. Mm. You'd think he wrote every one of those songs. And you'd think that he like lived those songs too. Like, I think of a song like Always on My Mind, you know, it was covered by so many people, but there's like such an intimacy to his version mm. of that, such a sadness. And you can really feel that and like him just looking back at like his marriage that had ended and just being like, you know, I probably messed up in a lot of ways and stuff and you you really feel that from him when he sings it it's almost like when johnny cash did that song hurt like so many people didn't know that nine inch nails did that one first just because they both conveyed those lyrics so well and told a story with mm. them he's great you know so much good stuff in his catalog do you think if yeah. elvis lived um you know to 80s or whatever do you think he would have still had a madison square garden type of career or he would have been playing clubs do you think you know if you had a crystal ball do you think That's, he would have gone on with it at, at worst he would, have, he would have been a las vegas resident yeah he would have been a vegas time. act and there's nothing wrong with that mm. or maybe That's like one of the tragedies i think of elvis is that 
he there was no blueprint for what an, a rock star did when they got old because he got mm. there first so it was mm. like <laughs> he went to he started wearing jumpsuits and went to vegas and he didn't know that there was another way and the colonel yeah. wouldn't let him tour outside yeah. i mean he he didn't do australia or the uk or europe he was strictly america um you know he didn't he did push Canada that one. did he oh, okay yeah, he did. yeah but that was the only mm. one you know he um there's lots of stories why that didn't happen uh but i mean uh, i think he would be a country artist country was huge in the 80s i think he would go that route if you listen to the last albums he does a lot of you have the album today which i have here which is a great country album i don't know if you can see it because i can't see the camera so it's oh, beautiful oh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, yeah 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 and you have moody blue which has a lot of country as well pledging my love and way down and all that so i think he would go in, in a country style and i think if he had he wanted to change managers if he had clean up his act i think he would have taken more control i hope so yeah yeah and wouldn't, it be great, wouldn't it be great if in the 80s if if he, he had the if all these people who he influenced started writing songs to him just like johnny just like johnny cash absolutely that would be just fantastic if, if Dylan had written a song for Elvis or Paul McCartney had written an album or, you know, it would, it would be very, very interesting to see where he would go. Yeah, I, 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 I would see him doing it like Rick Rubin doing a sort of something with Elvis, you know, in that yeah, similar vein is. as the Willie Nelson, the Neil Diamond, those later albums where Rick Rubin um and johnny cash i could see him doing that sort of thing i could see him doing a duets album like uh frank sinatra did before yeah. he died a couple duets i could albums. see that too that that's a christmas stocking stocking filler i reckon i think he would have messed around a little bit more with gospel music too i think that was something that was pretty special to him and maybe yeah. in like a country format but i think he would have kept more of that stuff in his music too or at least experimented a bit more with it I think it's very interesting because Elvis introduced me to so much music when I was very young. And to be honest, that's where my eclecticism came from. That's where I can go now and look at where I look at country albums and see this. Oh, where is this song I remember? Um, and, and gospel music and things like that. And I just, oh, I've, I've heard this before. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's my, that's you my picked, pick. You picked a great one. Yeah. I go. Very proud of you. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, yeah, I'll go, I'll go, I'll try to go real quick. Um, I was thinking about this. I actually brought this up on a uh, Zoom call recently. So that, that's why I actually thought of this artist when I know, know, knew that we were coming up to doing this recording. Um, and like, you know, like Ryan had said, and I think a couple other folks here had said, like, there's lots of bands from artists and genres where like, I like a song or I like a couple of songs, but like, I might not have ever listened to an album really or anything like this. So I picked a band I actually saw live and that I actually know, like at least their first album pretty well. Um, there's lots of like one-off stuff I like, like heart, the band Hardware. They're kind of like a super group. It's like Buddy Miles and Bootsy Collins. So like, they're what an incredible album. It's kind of like a really heavy uh, mm -hmm. album. It came out in the early '90s. There's stuff like that that I was thinking of, but that's not so far out of the regular of what I listen to. That it's kind of like yeah, it's a one-off or an odd one because it's the way that that album came about, but it's not exactly what we're talking about here. Um, and then, you know, Elvis would be a good one, other than the fact that, like, I love Elvis, and I like a lot of the old, like, 50s, like, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Buddy, I love all that stuff, you know, um, I like a lot of pop music, I like, you know, like, Boney M, but I only like a couple of songs, I like, you know what I mean, like, there's some disco tracks I like, there's some, like, 80s new wave I like, there's some, you know what I mean, there's some hip-hop I like, there's, you know, even, like, underground hip-hop stuff I used to listen to quite a bit, you know, like, even, like, Death, 
rap, like Necro and stuff that I've listened to quite a bit, you know, like there's a lot of stuff that I've listened to, but that's not so far out either because I've listened to quite a bit of hip hop and like even underground stuff. And so I'm trying to think like, well, like what could I come up with that would be a good pick of an odd one out. So this band was a big 90s pop band. I don't listen to a lot of 90s pop bands other than nostalgia for stuff like, you know, so you hear a Spice Girl song on the radio or, or Backstreet Boys. That, that was big when I was a kid. You know what I mean? So like, I don't mind listening to the hits, but I never had an album or never listened to the stuff, never saw them live. But uh, the band Aqua had a big hit called Barbie Girl. And they and they're, they had a lot of good songs, um, not just their one hit. And like, I've listened to their songs. I've listened to their stuff on Spotify or I've had like, you know what I mean? Times where I just listened to them by myself in the car. Like they, and they had a lot of songs and I'm very familiar with less, at least with their first album, which is really good. You know, like uh, Barbie Girl, um, Roses Are Red, My Oh My, Dr. Jones, Candyman. Like the list goes on where I'm like, I know a lot of their songs. I'm quite familiar with it. Yeah, it's nostalgic. I saw them live a few years ago uh, at Echo Beach in Toronto. And they were incredible. They were one of the best concerts I've ever seen. It was in one of those 90 shows. I think uh, Peter had mentioned like they have those compilate like packages of like, the, I think it was Aqua, uh, Wigfield, who did the song Saturday Night na, 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 in the 90s, and Prozac. Um, they were there too. They had a, they had a couple of hits. Um, and it was like an incredible show. I've seen, I've been to the Blackest of the Black tour. I've seen Demo Burger, or sorry, I butchered that name. Um, Demu Borger. Demu Borger. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, I've only seen them live. I never really listened to them, but I've seen them live. Danzig, I've seen the Gigantor with Megadeth, Dream Theater, Fear Factory, Nevermore. I've seen Kiss a bunch of times, Aerosmith. Like the list goes on and on of like hard rock, heavy metal bands that I've seen. Black Sabbath, Dio, like all these different groups that I've seen live. And um, one of the best shows I've ever seen, just atmosphere wise, was Aqua. Like they were incredible. Everybody was having such a good time in the audience that like you just felt high. Like I don't, I don't drink, I don't do drugs. I smoked the odd cigar here and there. And I felt like just this atmosphere of like, almost like I was high. Like they, they were having a great time. We were having a great time. We were on the beach. Everybody was just, you know what I mean? Like, I never felt like that. I've seen Greta Van Fleet. I've seen King Gizzard. Like I've, I've seen a bunch of bands. And I've never had an experience like that. Just Mark, an incredible do me experience. a favor. Yeah. Go like this. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be my odd one out. Not because I like one or two songs, because there's a ton of bands or artists where I like one or two songs, but because I'm actually familiar with some of their music. I've listened to their, at least the one album, um, you know, in the car by myself, and I've seen them live. That's a pretty far out pick. Yeah. Yeah. Those, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say two words for some of those songs. Earworm. Now that you've mentioned <laughs> yeah. it, it's going to be in my brain. Yeah. Yeah. So catchy. So catchy. Earworm. And the stuff for me, nostalgic, like hell, you know, like those songs, mm. especially Barbie mm. Girls, the music video mm -hmm. for that. And, everything, and so. it's a very, the lyrics are quite tongue in cheek. They're very satirical. It's not like superficial. If you look at the lyrics of that song, there, you know, there's a bit of depth, a bit of intelligence in that, you know, it's actually, uh, you know, what it's saying. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah so that, that would be my odd one out for me. Yeah, and I think that this, yeah, this was a really fun, fun conversation. It was interesting to hear people's perspectives. I think that about wraps it up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess I uh, got to go <laughs> let my dog out. Uh, <laughs> you want to know what my dog's name is? Is it Miley yeah. Cyrus? Miley. <laughs> oh, my God. oh, really? <laughs> oh, actually, really quick. Um, Jamie brought up Jamie brought up Lady Gaga. And I that was actually going to be my other choice. Lady Gaga. I love Gaga. And the. <laughs> I actually, I have, hopefully it finally happens, but I've had tickets to go see her at Fenway Park in Boston for like two years now. Wow. And I'm just yeah. hoping that eventually the concert happens. Uh, and it's, I, I absolutely can't wait to see her live. Drop us a awesome. review. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks everybody I'm for showing up. Miley Cyrus. <laughs> all right, Seriously? let's let's all go let our dogs out and uh, have a good night, everyone. Have a good night. All right, cheers. <laughs> all right, take care. Take care, everybody. <laughs>